All right. So let's talk about the physical process in a Schottky diode. Um, we're looking at the DC thermionic current and derive it in more detail and look at recombination generation ionization in the device and then at some AC and large signal response. So that's that's the aim for this section. Uh, let's review a little bit um, what we had drawn in terms of band edge diagrams and what that amounts to, to EK diagrams and uh, some more physical insight into uh, thermionic emission. Okay. So let's consider that uh, we're looking at an electron distribution that sits here in the semiconductor. And we know how to draw an EK diagram at the bottom of this band edge. Okay. And we know from this EK diagram how many carriers are flowing backwards and how many are flowing forward. That's really the expression of the crystal momentum we have in this structure. Right. So, so far, so good. If we're assuming that uh, carriers can only make it over the barrier here, so there's no tunneling involved. So it's a classical theory, and we can calculate a distribution of carriers. So we have a Fermi function, or in this case we're going to use a Boltzmann distribution that decays exponentially, and we have a density of states that rises as a square root of uh, uh, E. We've calculated that before. And so you have sort of a peaked function like this. Okay? And only the electrons that are above this barrier uh, tip can make it through through thermionic emission. Okay? Similar is true on the on the metal side. On the metal side we have a similar picture, except the density of states is much larger as we discussed. And also here we assume that only the carriers that are above this this barrier here can make it through to the end side. Okay. Now, here's this larger integral, right? We're going to look at the electron flow from the semiconductor to the metal. So we're going in this direction. That's the electron flow, negative sign here. And we are trying to integrate over this three-dimensional EK diagram. So that'll get us all the states. And we're interested in the momentum distribution that travels in this direction. Okay. So we're interested in the moment of the distribution that has a, a component of the velocity in the x direction. And we'll find that in the distribution of kx. And we're keeping the kx, uh, the ky, and the kz as a completeness because this is part of the three-dimensional density of states. Now, we're inter, uh, interested in the carriers uh, that, um, in all of the carriers in the uh, y direction, in all of the carriers in the z direction, and in the carriers that uh, have at least a minimum k available. Okay? So, um, here's the density of states in the structure that is uh, uh, indicated here, and we're integrating this density of states, and we have the occupation of this density of states as indicated here with E minus EF. All right, so we're thinking of a constant energy surface, and we're wanting to migrate up in energy, but we still have an EK um, an integration over k. And we're only interested in the carriers uh, in this direction. All right, this k min corresponds to a, um, a, a mi minimum velocity that the carriers must have. And I think this should actually be minus k min here and infinity up there. So this is actually an error here in this slide. Okay. So we're integrating from a k-min all the way up here, okay? So again, I think this should be minus uh, plus k-min k to infinity, okay? So now we're expanding out uh, this energy difference here of the electron against the conduction band and then measure it also against the Fermi level, okay? 
So, because the Fermi level is something nice, we can we can comprehend as an energy uh, balance well into the depth of the semiconductor. So, we're expressing. We have an expression up here for the carry distribution against the Fermi function, but we like to distinguish that between the energy um, that is kinetic and the energy that is a potential energy as measured from EC to EF. Okay. So again, we have kinetic contribution and a um, static uh, a potential energy. All right. So now we can. In this integral, we can plug this in here. This goes in here. And we are we can pull this term here ultimately out of the exponent, okay? And we're with this integral here where I, I need to check on this on this. I think this should be uh, uh, v min to infinity. All right, and we now have the, uh, we're transforming uh, the ek into velocities, so um, m, uh, m star v is uh, going into uh, the momentum distribution, and we have in the exponent our kinetic components of the carriers. Okay, all right. So now we have uh, three integrals that we can carry out because uh, the exponent splits into three parts, so we can factor the, the integral, okay? So let's um, carry this through, and we have, the, we have these three integrals. Now these are integrals over Gaussian that have a nice constant value, and again, as I stated, this should, I think, go from V minimum to infinity. Um, you can carry out this integral here, and you end up with a minimum, uh, with a minimum velocity that you have to have. It's the um, energy measured to the top of the barrier, which is VBI minus VA um, in terms of effective mass. And you can integrate this out, and you should get this term here. Okay, I'm going to check later if that's indeed, if I have the, the limits correct. Okay, that means now we have some expression here that has uh, VBI and VA in it. I can fold in my EF minus EC, that is this guy here, and here, and I find that I have some expression as a function of um, applied voltage with some coefficient up front, okay? And that coefficient is uh, applied voltage independent. And I've stuck a lot of information um, of the device in there, effective masses, density of states, etc. All right, now this is the uh, semiconductor to metal current uh, as a function of applied bias. And I had already calculated that uh, the uh, total current is the semiconductor to metal and the metal to semiconductor. and we had expressed um, this one here as a function of semiconductor to metal, and therefore we came to our diode expression like this. So this looks very familiar uh, uh, now. It's just derived in a slightly different way. Okay. Now, um, some insight on this thermionic current. If I compare this Schottky diode to the PN diode, the um, term for the applied bias um, is the same. It's the exponent with the applied bias. I have a coefficient up front that depends on the details of the junction. Now, both depend exponentially on VA, but uh, what you'll see is that the PN diode depend more strongly on temperature, since NI depends strongly on the band gap and on temperature, versus the Schottky diode doesn't have that. Okay, the Schottky diode is a majority carrier device. You dope it, it's less dependent on Ni. But the band gap of the semiconductor still shows up in here, and it hides in the built-in potential, because that is how we shift up and down the potential on the N side. 
and it's also hidden in the uh, uh, effective mass in the semiconductor. So, and the doping is of course included in EF minus EC. Okay, so those are in here. That's the doping um, detail. All right, so. That is the derivation of the thermionic current, really using a three-dimensional carrier distribution. And uh, now uh, we're going to look at the recombination and generation and ionization rather rapidly. So the key element really here is that uh, you can plot, again, the, uh, the forward bias current like this, and you have similar features as in the PN junction. And you can also look at the uh, recombination and generation current and plot it as well. Now, if you have recombination here, then uh, your current is being reduced. And your ideality factor uh, is uh, getting uh, reduced. It goes from 1 to 2. Okay, So the slope is changing, just like in the other uh, PN diode. Okay, Now, in the reverse bias, we can have similar effects. We can have, again, recombination as reverse bias. And if you have recombination here of carriers, then you, um, what you really have in the reverse bias, you generate carriers, so you have electrons hop up here, and that adds current to the device, and you get the square root of a voltage dependent, again, in the reverse bias direction. Again, again a slope that goes with the square root of the voltage is showing up again. And of course you can have the same type of breakdown behavior as well. So this the majority of the majority carriers is being rejected, but there could be Zener uh, tunneling. And any additional tunneling that can happen can also kick off uh, impact ionization. So you can have the same type of breakdown as what you had in the PN junction. So, in that sense, the two are not all that different. Okay, so you can calculate all of these uh, coefficients, etc., in the same way as a PN junction. So, we're not going to carry all of that through right now. Reminder, you can have the same correction M in there. You can have the same series resistance due to Fermi level drops here in the semiconductor, right? On the metal side, we won't have a Fermi level drop. So the series resistance here is primarily in the semiconductor. But of course, if you really, really have a long metal, again, you can have series resistance as well, and that'll show up as well. Okay. Now, let's go from the recombination generation into the AC and large signal response and look at uh, the devices in this way. All right. So this is similar to what we had before, but now we have a metal contact here and just uh, the semiconductor, the endoped semiconductor. Okay, and we had already thrown out pretty much any sort of details here um, that are happening in the, in the metal. Okay, but now we can carry through the whole um, calculations we had done before, but one thing to keep in mind is that these are responses here from the majority carriers, okay? This is a majority carrier device in the forward and the bi uh, reverse bias direction. We, we don't have minority carriers that we need to be considering. So really the diffusion capacitance is uh, not something we need to consider here. All right. Um, as mentioned before, it, the M depends on where you are in the IV characteristic. If you have Fermi level drops, uh, if you have um, uh, the, the next uh, disturbing item uh, on the uh, last forward uh, bias regime, um, the second one, and uh, you can differentiate this expression just like what we did with a PN junction. All right, so again here, um, we have taken the log, just like what we had done before. Now we can differentiate uh, with uh, respect to I, just like what we had done in the previous lecture on, um, on AC response of a PN diode. And we have the same forward 
uh, by his conductance uh, GFB. Okay, same expression again, same uh, current dependence. Okay, it's really a one-sided PN diode, so these expressions are going to be uh, the same, except we don't have the diffusion capacitance. Now, what's the response time? Again, similar to what we discussed before. Really, the only thing happening here is majority carriers being exchanged with a very large number of electrons that are available on the semiconductor side. So it's a majority carrier device. It's responding within the dielectric time constants of the system. All right. What's the capacitance? Again, um, same, right? Uh, dielectric constant, area, and the separation of the plates, and that's called W in this sketch here. It's really the depletion region width. We can calculate the width. We had expressions for that earlier in this section. We plug it in, and we see, again, that the junction capacitance is inversely proportional to the voltage that is being applied. Again, there's no diffusion capacitance. Why is that? Really, as soon as an electron that is reaching this point, and it could be injected as a minority carrier on the formerly P side, that is now a metal, what happens is these electrons rapidly decay. So they, they don't have to diffuse through, they don't contribute to another charge dipole on the other side that is sluggish in its response. So the assumption is that as soon as an electron makes it over, it never becomes a minority carrier. It gets destroyed right away and contributes uh, to the current. It's kind of like having an infinitely short relaxation time on the, on the P side. All right. So that's what I'm sketching here. On the band diode, whatever electrons you might have injected here on the P side, they slowly decay so to speak, and there's a diffusion process. And if you wiggled uh, the structure, that uh, AC response is going to be dependent on the diffusion time. But here, there are no minority carriers. Okay, Therefore, there's no diffusion capacitance. Now, um, that is again a reminder. If you want to reduce the, uh, the response time, the AC response time of a normal PN diode, you can introduce more scattering centers and therefore uh, have these electrons here decay rather rapidly. So scattering can be a good thing by adding traps if you really want to have a really fast uh, uh, PN diode in AC response. So this might be important for analog type devices. Okay, So the short minority carrier lifetime in PN junction diode is equivalent to the rapid energy relaxation in a Schottky barrier diode. All right, that means uh, in uh, large signals, it's all a rapid uh, carrier response. You don't have this issue with storage time and relaxation time. Response is instantaneous. So all you need is the uh, series resistance, series con uh, the conductance and the junction capacitance, and off you go uh, with your large signal responses as well. So. That gets me into the next section on practical issues on ohmic contacts, Schottky low, barrier lowering, and Fermi level pinning. I'll see you in the next section then.